Good morning, everybody, and welcome to church patio service on our double feature weekend here. Hey, we are going to be in Philippians chapter 3 for our study this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn to that chapter. There's a little bit of a shift, and you'll see it because Paul expresses some concerns that are obviously on his heart that he wants the people of Philippi to know about. And it takes a little turn where he's taken the first two chapters to really emphasize joy and uh, to remind us of our joy. And he will do that again in this chapter, but something is on his heart that he expresses concern for, and it becomes a great teaching for our theology even to this day to where we are. So let's pray and commit our study of the word to the Lord and ask the Spirit of God to be our teacher, which only he can do properly for us to understand. So Jesus, we thank you as we've been singing to you for the sweet name, your salvation, your care for your church. Father, we thank you from sent from heaven above, sending your son for our salvation and pouring your spirit upon us. And Spirit, because that's your desired work, we ask that to be done today. Fall fresh upon us anew. Teach us and guide us as you do and meet us here. And may we be enlightened to what you would have us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, Paul does what we uh, would see as a great pastor's trick here, you might think, when halfway through his sermon he uses the word, Finally, which means, you know, when a normal pastor says that, you got another hour or so to go before the message is over. But that's not really what he means. He, he means that finally in the sense of as a result of everything we've learned so far, I, I want to instruct you as well with this important truth. And he starts out again by the, the factor of joy. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Finally, my brethren... When you take all of this into consideration, rejoice, be joyful, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. He's been writing about joy and rejoicing in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And that's a very secure thing, a safe thing. So I'll repeat it, Paul says. As you know, I think in chapter 4 he'll say, Rejoice in the Lord, and again I will say rejoice. Through the book, the theme is joy. But you can have joy and celebrate joy and still receive the instruction about dangerous things. And that's where he is going in verse 2. Let me get to the one, two, three blow uh, as he lays it out in verse 2. He says, beware of dogs, three bewares, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. That's quite a jump from, hey, let's sing about joy and talk about joy, rejoice in the Lord. And then he puts up the big beware of a dog sign. I don't have a dog anymore, but I do have a couple beware of dog signs that I've kept through the years. And uh, they are a, a deterrent many times. And that's exactly what they are designed to be. If you are aware of something, then you've been notified. And he says there are three things you should be aware of. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the mutilation. Let me set our stage just briefly because you'll see that this flows pretty much with what Paul is concerned about. The dogs, uh, the term dogs as it was used by the Jews would be a derogatory mark typically to a Gentile. They're not Jews, so they are considered to many Jews dogs. And in their culture, dogs weren't, as we know most of our dogs, at least in America, they weren't family pets. They would be scavengers and uh sometimes roving packs. Whenever I see this term in the Bible, I always go back to actually the ministry we still are involved with, Spectrum Ministries. And I used to go down below the border every Thursday 
and we'd minister in the Tijuana dump. You know, you might remember that Spectrum Ministry still does. They have these vans that they fill with water, water tanks of these vans, and they circulate over the, the muffler system and it heats up the water by the time they go from San Diego to the Tijuana or Rosarita or however far down we were going, the water would be hot in these holding tanks and we'd come to where all these people, many of them actually lived at the dump, they minister the poorest of the poor, and that would be there once a week or once every other week, the only time they could get a hot bath by this water brought from San Diego and still warm when we got there. So they had a great little portable shower system and curtains and divided the boys and the girls and give them new clothes when they were done. But at the Tijuana dump, one of the things we had to be cautious, and I only saw it one time, but one thing we had to be cautious about were packs of dogs. And sometimes you'd look out, you know, the people live there because they try and get the glass and recycling materials out of the dump, very dangerous, uh, toxic place to live, but they were extremely poor. And they would, they told me stories where these dogs would come and attack the children. So you would see uh, one or two dogs, no big deal, but you see a pack of 10 dogs, they have a completely different attitude. So when I think of dogs, it's a little more closer to the biblical viewpoint that Paul's going to bring to place. The Jews would use that as very, as you can tell, very derogatory to the Gentile. Paul's going to flip things around because when he says beware of dogs and he says beware of evil workers and the mutilation, he's actually talking about the legalistic Jews. They're very used to calling Gentiles dogs. Now Paul is calling them dogs. You're like a low-life dump dog for what you're doing. And you can kind of tell what they're doing just by the description. So the three bewares are dogs, evil workers, and the mutilation. For then he goes into this statement. We'll come back to those three. But he goes into this statement for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. In other words, his attack and his warning to be aware of the dogs, the evil workers, and the mutilation is in regards to their position of thinking they are right with God because of something they've done in the flesh. And he calls them dogs because they were trying to put that on Christians in the sense of saying, that's okay that you're a Christian, but you need to be a Jew. You need to become Jewish first before you can be a complete Christian. And the only way you can do that is through legalism. Get yourself circumcised, you know, follow our rules. And they were adding to something that should never be added to for our salvation. We come to salvation by grace, through faith, with no works. Now pop back up to his three signs that he's posted. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Those who tell you you have to have works for your salvation. And beware of mutilation. And he chooses that deforming word, mutilation, to kind of throw back, hey, when you talk about circumcision, obviously an act of the flesh, you're really just mutilating people for no reason. You're mutilating them, telling these people, adult males, that they have to be circumcised for your own evil work. And in Acts 15, you can read where the council met at Jerusalem and they decided very clearly that that didn't need to happen. But there are always people, and there is still to this day, who will want to throw legalism around and say, well, that's nice that you have a relationship with Jesus, but you also need to add this. Sadly, it's common in some denominations, very common in the cults, and that's why they can dictate so much and people will follow them. By the way, I don't know if you read, but there's a, I don't know if it's a new cult. Everyone turn around and stare at the late arriver. Sharon could not sleep all night. She texted me earlier and said she was going to go back to bed. So uh, 
I think she might stay in her car, but make sure you greet her and glad that she's here. Anyways, I'm giving this illustration. You know, Kauai still has a two week quarantine. So if you go over, you can get a great fare right now, but you have to stay in your place for two weeks. But supposedly it's ending in about nine days, on the end of the June. So this guy that started a cult recently, he doesn't like to be known as that. He takes uh, 14 people over to the Big Island a week and a half ago. And uh, you have to sign and, you know, when you fly and understand you've got to stay in your hotel or vacation rental by owner. And within 20 minutes after they checked into their place, they were at the Hilo Beach Park to two or three of them. But they also had uh, women and children, you know, in this place. So HPD came in, arrested the guy and two of his leaders, or two of his companions, hauled them to jail. They decided not to arrest the others because they didn't want to get Child Protective Services involved. And they shipped them home a few days ago. That's what they're doing. They're just shipping them straight home. So I think in my mind, most people hear the news and know there's a quarantine and know there, but sometimes a, a legalist can have that kind of power. You know, um, I mean, you, if I say, hey, everyone, God told me we're going to Maui, you'd probably say, oh, good. Uh, but wait a minute, Pastor, we read the news and maybe you'd give me a lay and say, have a good time. But that would be about it. But legalism has this trapping power and, and authority, false authority, but it, it's real to those people. And it intimidates. And so that happens in cults, that happens in some denominations to these days, uh, even in the days we live. But it happened big time in the early church. So Paul comes out swinging. Beware of those dogs. Beware of those evil workers. Beware of those who would want to mutilate you over this symbolism of the law, circumcision. And then he says here in this verse we just read, verse 3, we are the circumcision. And he's referring to <coughs> people without legalism. We who trust Christ and nothing else have our circumcision. We are right. We are set apart. Not by something we do physically, but by something Christ did physically on the cross. Nothing can be added to that. So that's where he's going with that. He also gives evidence here. We are the circumcision, verse 3, who worship God in spirit. You don't worship God in flesh in the sense that you do these work type of things. So we are circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And this will launch him in to his personal LinkedIn bio that he will use to remind them, if we're going there, if you want credit for your flesh, check this out. And he refers to himself as a Jew with all the top awards and recognition that he should have as a Jewish leader. So understand first, he said, no confidence in the flesh, though, and it's like Paul saying, though, if you want to go there, let me tell you about my flesh. No confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, because I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Listen to his credentials. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews I am, concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I was considered blameless. So it's like Paul saying, I who have all of those qualifications, and he's saying this to, to sting the legalist, but to warn his church. I who have all these credentials, I've got all the Eagle Scout patches, I've got all the things of Judaism that could, as high as you can go, I have all of that. Let me tell you what it's worth in the face of Christ. He says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, all of those things he just listed, tribe of Benjamin, 
Pharisee, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. They mean nothing. They score me no points. They do not make me better than you or more spiritual than you. In the light of Christ, only Christ does that. So if you want to play ball, let me bring out my trophies and we'll go one-on-one, -on -one, Paul says. But all of that does not matter. Matter of fact, he's going to use some harsh words to describe the comparison of it in just a moment. He says, I've counted it loss for Christ. Verse 8, yet indeed I also count all things lost, not just the Jewish accomplishments, but I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Just to know him, everything else is lost compared to that. Nothing matters except to know Jesus Christ and to walk in his fellowship. So I count everything else lost as compared to to my knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He's not complaining. Do you remember where he's at? He's in jail. He's chained. His freedom is gone. His friends are far away. All of his pile of trophies do not matter. And he says, I counted all in the favor of Christ and I've suffered loss for all things. And notice what he counts them as. I count them as, as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. All of my Jewish accomplishments, anything in life, I count as rubbish. It's a stronger word than rubbish. It's excrement. <laughs> it's dung. And it's used purposefully. I, I count it as all of that, anything aside from the grace of Christ, any works, any legalism, I count it as something disgusting in compared to knowing Christ. Well, that's a man coming to the end of himself, isn't it? Paul's not going to walk into our church on any given Sunday and say, hey, I deserve to speak because I've been a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin and all of these different things. You know, people still do that. They do it with Jewishness. They do it with Gentileness. <laughs> they do it with their years of church attendance. They do it with their school credentials. And they think they are someone, but Paul says, you are nothing. And he uses that word rubbish, which has a much more significant, in the Greek, has a much more significance to it. Paul says, hey, it's all about Jesus. And I count everything else as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having, and this is the point, not having my own righteousness. That's what they were teaching. If you are circumcised and you follow Jewish customs, then you will be made more righteous. You will have your own righteousness. And that's how many Jews believe to this day that they can have the righteousness. But we know clearly from scripture that our righteousness only comes from Christ. Anything else is rubbish. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Without the resurrection, without the death of Christ, there is no righteousness. But with the death of Christ and the power of the resurrection, which he wants to know that full power, then we are made right with Christ by faith. Sometimes it's good to review those verses because at a glance it can sound a little confusing. But Paul tries to break it down really clear. He is preaching passionately against any legalism. So stop just before we take on the final couple of verses here. Stop and think about the temptation that you may have had to be legalistic in a certain way. They don't worship like we do, sometimes we say. Um, I'm trying to check myself even in our modern day of dialogue and debates or what's projected at me. And it's very easy for me in this day and age to say, 
idiot, and walk away. Uh, or I might even say rubbish and mean what it means in the Greek. But that is a form of legalism. As we were talking yesterday, we're to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. That's a form of legalism when we just write people off and say it can only be my way. Now, don't misunderstand. Biblically, as Paul's saying, there's only one way to righteousness, and it's through Christ and his resurrection, his death and resurrection. But how we treat people, Christians and non-Christians, can be a very form of legalism. You don't worship my way. You don't study my way. You don't believe my way. I can become very legalistic. And different pastors do that all the time. So it's something we have to guard against and be very aware of. Paul says, be careful of that. Here's what you focus on, that our faith is in Christ, and that's where our righteousness comes from. And I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. He was suffering as he writes this. Sometimes we think in our legalism, I like all the parts of Christianity until the pastor starts reading verse 10 and the suffering part. None of us like suffering. None of us want that. But Christ is saying, compared to legalism, compared to anything I can bring to the table, I want my righteousness in Christ only, and that includes a fellowship of suffering, and I want to be conformed to his death if by any means I obtain to the resurrection of the dead. And we all will hope, uh, our hope and faith is either by rapture or by death, will be a part of the resurrection in the final day. Paul again doesn't know if he's going to live or die at this point, but he says that doesn't even matter. All I want to know is the power of his resurrection. Uh, it's, it's like saying all I want to know is the power of God in my life. And I want it in every area of my life. I want to know how to respond correctly. I want to know how to worship correctly. I, I want to know that even when I think I'm doing good, that it's really the good that Christ did that saves me. I, I don't want to worry about measuring up to God. Now, we have responsibilities. The Bible teaches us how we should live and how we are to obey. And that's not what he's talking about here. Legalism comes in and, and starts saying, you need to do for your salvation. And Paul is saying, no, no, God has already done for your salvation. Done by giving Christ to us on the cross and the resurrection. So to know the power of his resurrection is to know the spirit-filled life. To know the power of his resurrection is to say, Ooh, I'm not going to fall in that trap of legalism. That guy wants me circumcised. That guy wants me eating certain foods. That guy wants me to follow his rules. And we as Christians fall back and say, oh, but Christ, Christ says, I love you. I've cared for you. I paved the way for you. Now come in the fulfillment of the spirit, the fulfillment of the spirit. Let him live in your life. Let him transform the way you think and speak, not out of legalism, but out of love and take that to this hurting world. So now I'm going to give you a Mark Barrett mini potential prophecy. I'm not going to call it a prophecy because you could stone me if I'm wrong. But here's what I think. This is just Mark thinking as I've been praying. I think over the next five months, there's going to come another wave. I'm not saying we're done with looters and protesters and movements. But I, I think, and part of this I think is already happening. This is just my assessment. So see, I closed the Bible. I'm not adding to the Bible. This is some thoughts I have. I think a wave is gonna come and it already has started of confusion. Some of the very people that have been expressing their anger and rightfully so, we may respond differently than they do, but we've seen some horrible things on every side of these issues and we want justice for that I, matter of fact I have not heard I've had some dialogue with some police officers lately I've, had, I've not met or heard anybody especially law enforcement say what happened in Minneapolis was okay everyone has denounced what we saw during those eight minutes that, that I've come in contact with so the reaction has happened 
the cries for justice, organizations have formed or taken more power. Many of those organizations have been hijacked by other people's agendas and issues, and now you see a lot of confusion. And people can't even state what they stand for in the, in the core values or principles. Sometimes they don't know, they're just caught up in the, in the moment. I think a wave of confusion is starting to happen. And some will dissipate, some will become more angry, some will react in new different ways, some will have clarity, but I think it's such an important time for the church to say, okay, I may not like what I see, or maybe you've been fearful or whatever the issues are, but this is exactly why God has us here at this time to be in positions, and some of these positions, by the way, I know are in your family relationships and neighbors and friends, to be in positions where we're not responding in the ways of the world, it's all right to be passionate, but we're responding by the love of Christ. In other words, to take Paul's point, we are learning to respond by the power of the resurrection. The man wrote that with a chain on his wrist. Not where our position is. Paul says, you want to talk about that? I'm a Jew of Jews, Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin. He puts all that aside and chooses the power of the resurrection. I believe this wave is coming and if we are in tune with God in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our culture, in our society, this is the very thing that Jesus talks about when he says, you'll be known by your love. The way you love God and the way you love others. And that moves far beyond the church. I said this yesterday. I'm not suggesting you change your core values. I'm suggesting that we be very attuned because I think in the prophetic plan of God, the confusion comes, then people feel guilty or they feel lost and they're still searching because there is no complete justice until we stand before the ultimate judge. There is no supreme court outside of the supreme judge and that will eventually come. And we have that peace and we have that understanding. And I am about social change and everything else that comes with it. But I understand this, that in this world, it constantly fails. Doesn't mean you don't try, but it fails. As it fails, the wave will continue with confusion and isolation and loneliness. We talked about the suicide rate that has soared just during COVID and now the additional things. So my suggestion is this, seek the power of the resurrection in your life. Let's seek it as a church. Let's recognize all that we've read about prophecy in the end times. Whenever that is that Christ will return, we are certainly living in days that warn of it, that say be ready, but don't bury your head. Don't turn into a legalist. Instead, humble your heart before the mighty one of God, God himself, and then I'm going to be bold enough, and this is what I'm trying to do in very cautious ways, I'm going to be suggest you be bold enough to go out and love these people. And I'm not saying an us versus them. You show the love of Christ first. You be a listener. You be one that empathizes and sympathizes with people that are confused and hurt, lost and lonely. You start the conversation. You be an example of listening. And it's just like God to say, oh, guess what? Can I share what someone told me? Could I share this Jesus with you that many people miss? Can I share a love that maybe you haven't seen? Or I sometimes am starting conversations like this. Would you like to see what true justice looks like? Okay, you're going to have to be brave because it's not just justice against other people. It's justice against me. Would you like to see what true accountability looks like? I'll share a verse with you. I'm suggesting to you that there are going to be many opportunities, and there are now, 
But we don't want to miss that. Here's how you prepare. Pray to God simply this way. God, examine my heart. Wash anything out that should be there. Any legalism, any racism, anything that would come across my way, give me a clean heart. Give me the power of your resurrection and then put me on patrol. Because I guarantee you, friends, people are passing through your life, social media-wise, personally, they're passing through your life. They're lonely, they're scared, they're hungry, and God wants you to give them the right meal. He's chosen us, not exclusively, but we're part of the family that should be able to deal this generation. And here's my premise on it all. If you weren't able to handle it, God wouldn't have you here. If you weren't able to handle what's going on here with the power of Christ, you would not be here. But you are, and he's equipped you, and he's equipped me. And I'm not suggesting we're going to do it perfectly. But we have some knowledge, and we have some spiritual gifts, and we have some things of the Lord that this world is desperate to hear. And he's chosen wonderful people like you to distribute that. None of that is a legalistic trick, just for clarification. None of that is to put a heavy on you. That's simply to take to the Lord and say, wow, you want to use me in this? Then I want to be used. And I want to be used how you want me to be. Let's pray. The power of your resurrection opens the door of legalism and flushes it away. We don't rely on ourselves in anything. We rely on you. We seek you, Holy Spirit. We seek your power. We seek that outpouring that only you give and fills us anew. In our own personal struggles, and our own depressions or loneliness or confusion. Wash that away and fulfill us a new spirit of God, we pray. And open the doors wide for us to be used. Help us not to fear. Help us not to come with our own agendas. But just to rely on you as we are used. And we entrust ourselves to you for your plan, not ours. To be used of God, to sing, to speak, to pray. To be used of God, to show someone the way. I long so much to feel the touch of his consuming power to be used of God is my desire let's sing that again to be used of God to sing to speak to pray to be used of God, to show someone the way. I long so much to feel the touch of his consuming fire. To be used of God is my desire.